Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today's presentation is Magnetic Signature of Strange Radiation Part 3 and I'm bringing it all together. So, what am I bringing together? Well, I'm bringing the last several presentations together and uh, I'm going to read through this short paper by Bogdanovich et al. and it's called Experimental Study of Environment or Ionization in the Zone of a Periodic Discharge in a Flow of Liquid, PDFL. The study of the ionized environment in the area surrounding PDFL has shown the presence of visible plasmoids moving in the horizontal plane. The study of traces on the X-ray film made it possible to detect a significant number of traces of an identical shape and size that looked like birds, which were found earlier in other facilities. The preliminary analysis has been carried out for their identification, which led to the conclusion about the nature of these formations. In particular, their identity with the Dirac monopole, or some similar object, having a tail and wings formed by the flow of electrons from the surroundings. This is very critical. Having a tail and wings formed by the flow of electrons from the surroundings. From the very beginning of work with PDFL in 1995 to 1996, the appearance of unusual pinch plasmoids in the zone adjacent to the discharge was noted. In particular, there were luminous filaments up to a few centimetres long, having an increased luminosity at the ends. In some cases, these filaments hung in the air. In other cases, one of the filament ends extends to the grounded substrate. And the overall pattern resembled a firework. Luminous long-lived plasmoids were observed in the environments in the following years, and their distance from the discharge could be several centimetres or more which excludes the possibility of explaining their appearance by the presence of liquid droplets sprayed by shock waves. To clarify the nature of these phenomena, the authors have carried out studies to determine the properties of plasma formations in the vicinity of discharge, in particular their ionizing ability. And so here is a periodic discharge here, and it's going into the grounding plate here. And there is one sort of plasmoid here and one sort of plasmoid here. Periodic discharge in a flow of liquid. A white circle identifies a plasmoid in the air. So in this one, it's got another plasmoid identified here. Periodic discharge here in a flow of liquid. Flow of liquid. A water white circle identifies the plasmoid located on the surface of a treated sample after the discharge. And in this one here, we have this structure here, which you can see when you look at the PDF that I will supply in the description to this video. But however, it's got this arc here, which is like a it's like a string which is glowing brightly and even brighter at the ends. A periodic discharge in a flow of liquid, a white circle identifies a luminous fil filament. The experiment scheme is shown in this figure, and what you're looking is effectively from the top down through the discharge. And that is one. And then these are X-ray films arranged around the discharge axis. The film was placed at a distance of 19 centimetres from the axis of the facility. The film size was 18 centimetres by 24 centimetres. The films were placed vertically suspended on special holders in double polyethylene envelopes, opaque to light radiation. The films and envelopes were manufactured by Retina X-ray XBE Blue Sensitive Film USA. So these are kind of like medical x-rays. They're blue and you put them up in the special viewers that you might have seen in the hospital to view x-rays where it gives you extra contrast. So. Several sessions were held, each lasting five minutes. The discharge parameters voltage on the high voltage electrode maximum is 7.5 kilovolts. During the current pulses of 2 to 2.5 microseconds, pulse repetition frequency is 50 hertz. The maximum current in the pulse is up to 5 kiloamps. A detailed description of the facility operation, the measurement technique, the discharge parameters and the measurement procedures have been repeatedly given earlier and so forth. The film was developed by specialists in an accredited laboratory with industrial equipment designed for this purpose. It's basically a rapid development machine. You, you can see when you go and look up this uh, X, 
ray XB blue sensitive film. The analysis of traces showed the following. I've added this graphic on the end here to help with the description that they give. A film with traces, the most visible traces are marked in white. So here, blown up, and I've blown it up even further here. All films, without exception, showed a large number of traces of objects which looked like birds, swallow swifts, with a wing spread of up to one centimetres. There we go. As a rule, the length of the straight section is from three to five millimetres, so this little bit coming down here. The most surprising was the significant number of cases dense on the film and even spots were detected in the head part of the traces, drawing suspicion to thermal effects as if from burning, which may indicate a thermal impact, but not a mechanical one. There are corresponding bulges on the back side of the film. No less surprising is the fact that there are similar dents on the back side of the film. At the same time, no such traces were found on the envelopes, neither external nor internal, which indicates the selective resonant nature of the radiation effect on the substance which the film consists of, in particular on the chemical agents of the photosensitive coating. So given the fact that he describes in the abstract that these are electrons being moved around, uh, could this be some sort of silver-based photosensitive coating? I don't know. Maybe someone would like to investigate that. If it was silver, we know that it is... Uh, the most conductive, that is to say that it is able to give up its electrons into its electron C very readily. At the same time, no such traces were found on the envelopes. And so that's that. The orientation of the position of the birds is mostly chaotic. And they are going to try and find out by further experiments, you know, clarification of the systematic uh, general features, depending on the parameters of the environment, is being carried out at the present time. Now, this paper is actually from... I think it was released May last year, 2019, um, but it was actually uh, for work done in 2018. The total number of such traces at the time of writing the paper was at least 100. To exclude the likelihood of the appearance of traces as a result of breaking the conditions for developing or storing the film, a number of control sessions without a discharge were carried out, eliminating possible interpretations and suspicions. Now, they didn't only do this, they did other things. But um, I just want to show you that this, this structure, these birds, are essentially identical to those recorded by uh, Alexander Shishkin in this presentation that I shared in late 2018 that was presented at Sochi. So here are a number of very, very clear birds. And it has this uh, top here with this little tail, top here with this little tail. And it always seems to have one of the wings a little bit further out than the other. Uh, and uh, we'll come to the reason why. Now, uh, in, in around the underneath this, they found these pit craters. And they were able to categorize the pit depth and width based on the... Uh, ions that were captured into that structure as it went through the materials that it went through. And so they've got a very defined constant here and the depth and the width depending on the atoms that it captured inside it. Now they also found that they could produce these in many ways. A hydrodynamic generator, that was his preferred way, so that's like a sort of cavitation device from revolving bodies made of various materials. So this is very, very fast revolving materials. From materials irradiated with gamma radiation, i.e. materials where you've got some other gamma source and you are then exposing it to the gamma radiation. From gamma sources, cobalt-60 and, and cesium-137. So this is like essentially the same. It's kind of like these are the sort of gamma sources you would have to gamma radiate other things. So there's going to be ionization in there. And by applying a high voltage pulse of plus and minus 590 volts on an X-ray film in an opaque package located between the plates of a flat capacitor with an 8 millimeter distance between the electrodes. From reactor producing corona stream discharges, RCSD, and these are kind of the sort of thing that you might have a Jacob's Ladder, uh, even a, a Tesla ball, and that might make you think, well, maybe we can observe these structures from these kind of devices from generators Spielmann and Shak Paranov. Okay, so we will go back to Bogdanovich's paper, but essentially exactly the same structures 
were observed in all those different kinds of experiments and they looked exactly the same as Bogdanovich's here. Now, this is interesting. Photographic recording of objects in the same electronic synchrotron PACRA. By coincidence, during the period of the experiments with PDFL, the authors had to conduct similar photographic recording sessions on the same film in double envelopes in another facility, namely in the electronic accelerator PACRA, synchrotron energy with energy up to 1.2 giga electron volts. The experimental scheme is shown in figure 6. So you have the synchrotron, then the output, the electron beam, then you have 5, 4, 3 are sections of conversion target, 2 is a magnet deflecting the electron beam, so all the electrons are going out here, and then you have a gamma ray, essentially. So this is effectively what he is saying here, that uh, if you irradiate something or you have gamma rays involved, you will get these things occurring, and one is the X-ray film. The objective of the experiment was to determine the trace of a bremsstrahling beam from the conversion target here uh, after the passage of electrons through it. The electron beam was then deflected in a magnet with a vertical magnetic field with the induction of up to 1.5 tesla and a length of about 1 meter. The film was located about 1 meter from the edge of the magnet. The electrons reaching the film are excluded the control measurements were conducted. So there are no electrons reaching the film. In the zone of film localization, the presence of the magnetic scattering fields from the magnet is estimated to be of the order 10 to the minus 2 Tesla. At the same time, the presence of ionization in the air from an electron beam and a beam of bremsstrahling gamma radiation is recorded. So in this area around here, you've got much less of the magnetic field, but you do have ionization of the air. In the developed photographs, as one would expect, traces of bremsstrahling beam were detected. The edges of the magnets can be seen. The gap between the poles of the magnets is about six centimeters. So I guess this is the radiation, the bremsstrahling radiation that was um, created by passing through the conversion target and this is the the between the two poles of the magnet so this is this is what's getting through this is what they were actually looking for <laughs> um, uh, in the developed photographs as one would expect that's the bremsstrahling radiation to our greatest surprise the same birds were found here we go outside of the magnet field as well as during experiments with PDFL so the same birds that they found in PDFL were found in this uh, gamma beam having gone through some metal conversion targets. So this is essentially saying and confirming what was observed in the 9 and 10 year research by Shishkin et al. at Dubna in Science City. That's north of Moscow. And so they've irradiated some materials and out of it they have got some of these birdies appearing and some below the magnet and some above the magnet. Now, that may be relevant. Okay. Uh, previously, the same facts were not presumably taken into consideration, even if they had occurred. So that they hadn't bothered looking for these things. They'd only bothered looking for what was going on with the conversion target. Comparison of experiments in both cases allows us, first of all, to note the similarity of the presence of the following factors. A high degree of ionization in the zone of the film localization, i.e. this is caused by ionization, so we know there's going to be a lot of ionization in the location of the film. Impulse nature of the effect of ionized factors, namely the pulse duration was 2 to 3 microseconds and repetition frequency 50 hertz. So this is very similar to what they were using to do the plasma flow discharge. Magnetic field directed mainly parallel to the plane of the film. So it's going here and so the field is there and the field is going like that. Rem styling tracing. A white circle marks the birds. On the right there is an enlarged image. So, if there are any scientists out there that have access to a synchrotron and want to know what's going on in Lena, and they can't be bothered to do some discharging through water, but they've got a synchrotron, you should give this a go and see what you find.
Ionization of the air in the PDFL zone is caused both by the expansion of the discharged plasma and by soft X-rays, photoionization is not excluded. The electromagnetic field is generated in the zone of the LPI accelerator from the accelerator and the output beam has an amplitude of the same order of the EMP from the plasma flow discharge. So they're saying basically there's an EMP from the PDFL, that, that, those discharges, and that that has a similar amplitude of electromagnetic field in the accelerator. Okay, analysis of the results. As a working hypothesis on the formation of traces, we consider a version of the formation of microobjects in the ionized air, having all the features similar to the Dirac monopole, with the accompanying cone-shaped electron tail consisting of Cooper pairs with high penetrating power in the environment. Now, this reference is quite relevant, but I just want to say at this point that Hutchison obviously ionizes and polarizes his air. He also has always, in every one of his experiments, a discharge. Originally it was between a spark gap in the air and then it was a discharge in a xenon uh, uh, arc lamp and that was ex-military. And so basically uh, I'm going to look at the paper that he's referring to here because I think it pulls in a lot of context but I'll just read the, the rest of this. This version is confirmed by the analysis, this version that's being discussed here. This version is confirmed by the analysis of traces representing in their curved part the cross-section of the conical surface identified with the electron trail, whereas a rectilinear trace can be a monopole track. This version requires clarification. The different orientation of the birds can be explained by the dynamics of the objects under consideration having both a magnetic and electric charge. Now I'm going to look at this paper. Like I say all the links will be in the presentation so if you can't read it um, then you can read it later. So I've done a, a rough machine translation of this paper because it was only available in Russian and I will read through this. The modern theory of low temperature superconductivity is based on the idea of macroscopic quantum state of a superconductor, which is convincingly confirmed by the quantization of the magnetic flux circulating in the superconducting ring. The discovery of the Josephson effect finally confirmed the researchers uh, in the validity of this theory. Numerous experimental data have confirmed the macroscopic nature of the phenomenon and revealed the extreme consistency of the Josephson ratio for non-stationary effect. However, the deep mechanisms of the phenomenon remained hidden from researchers due to the inability of quantum mechanics to reveal the process leading to spatial and phase quantization of microparticles in a superconductor. It is necessary to clarify the physical mechanisms of the Josephson effect. In one of the leading experts in superconductivity, V. Parker, believes that the Josephson relation can be derived from completely general assumptions and therefore is accurate. And the author of the effect, Brian Josephson himself, in the Nobel Lecture on Physics, expressed the opinion that the whole theory, apparently, has only a mathematical interest, as was soon suggested by some authors. One cannot agree with this opinion. The theory of electron-phonon interaction has left in the shadows the true reasons for the constancy of the Josephson ratio. It turned out that the organized behavior of Cooper pairs in a superconductor is associated with another secret physics, the Dirac monopole. It is the monopole that collects the electrons into Cooper pairs and organizes the pairs themselves into spatial and phase order. And it is the Dirac monopole that ensures the high consta constancy of the Josephson ratio. This article attempts to describe the phenomenon of superconductivity, and in particular the Josephson effect, based on the principles of classic electrodynamics. You can look at this in your own time. I'm just going to pull out a couple of things here. It goes into all the maths. Like I say, I think it's only a rough translation at the moment, but potentially I might do a, a much better translation with all the formulas in there. Okay, so 
Cooper pairs. The American physicist L. Cooper was the first to put forward the idea of paired electrons in low-temperature superconductors, and then, together with his co-authors, created a consistent microscopic theory of superconductivity, the central point of which is the idea of the phase coherence of the electron pairs in the body of the superconductor. The almost complete absence of resistance, quantization, and magnetic flux, all known fundamental properties of the superconductor, are associated with the existence of phase coherence of the Cooper pairs. These are facts confirmed by experiment. Difficulties arise when answering the questions, what makes two electrons unite into a Cooper pair despite their Coulomb repulsion from each other? And what force arranges these pairs into a single order called macroscopic phase coherence? Most of the theories of superconductivity use the concept of electron-phonon interaction for this. Sometimes to describe the mechanism of superconductivity, completely exotic objects such as axon process or the so-called excitons in a superconducting structure are used with which conduction electrons interact, uniting into Cooper pairs. It's given the reference for that there. The common thing with all of these various mechanisms of combining electrons into Cooper pairs is the following. Electron pairs, and therefore phase coherence in the superconductor, is formed not without the help of the atoms of the substance in which the superconductivity is observed. Okay. And it goes on. This fact is most clearly manifested in the studies of superconductivity of he heavy fermions, compounds with heavy fermions called those in which the effective mass of electrons is very high. OK, so I, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, you can, like I say, you can read it in your own time. It's just giving an introduction there. Now, it runs through a whole bunch of mass, but essentially it has a magnetic core, whatever that is. And they have a vortex electric field. OK. And that's going towards that magnetic core. The angular velocity of the Cooper pair is equal to the induction uh, B. And so this is your angular velocity down here to the induction B. We carry on. Talks about Josephson vortexes. Right. This is plane logarithmic spiral inclination angle Y. Con constant tangent to the radius vector of the point. So you've got the point and it's coming in like this. Now, I'm, I'm giving you the bare minimum. hope you can grasp it and then I'll do some physical experimental stuff, hopefully, if I've got time. So, thus the proposed model of the formation of Cooper pairs and the phase coherence are due to the vortex E field and the point source of the magnetic field in which two electrons of the Cooper pair are accelerated along two converging logarithmic spirals. The spirals of the logarithmic curve are shifted by angle uh, pi, so the electrons are located in the instantaneous orbit in antiphase. So they're always in antiphase to each other. At any point of the trajectory, of a pair on an instantaneous orbit, equality is satisfied. This diagram is trajectories of motions of Cooper pairs. Maybe I can zoom in, you can see. Which ensures the spatial and phase coherence of the Cooper pairs themselves. In the process of accelerating a pair from zero speed to maximum, the radius of instantaneous orbit decreases to the minimum. For this reason, the shape of the Josephson vortices resembles a funnel, or rather, an atmospheric vortex-like tornado, a vortex of electrons or electron tornado, most accurately reflects the shape of Josephson vortices. Here we have the so-called Dirac monopole structure. So you have a tail here with your electrons, and here you have the magnetic core, and then you have the rotor, and the rotor is expanded out here and this is your rotor with your B field going up through here and these electrons coming in so that you, you've basically zoomed into this point. So they're coming in uh, and speeding up and whatever and going into the minimum radius here and I guess if there are two, two by two by two coming in uh, forming Cooper pairs then you get an intense uh, structure forming around here. So that is essentially it Dirac's monopole. 
The above described spatial structure of the Josephson vortices will not be complete if one does not point out one more facet of the Josephson relation. To do this, we multiply the left and right sides of equality by the speed of light in the vacuum. Okay, so I'll read the key point here. This allows us to assert both that Josephson relation and the intensity flow of Dirac's monopole are two facets, two characteristics of the same natural phenomenon. Both the Josephson vortices and the Dirac monopole are elements of the same system, which is formed in a superconductor and manifests itself as the Josephson effect. In the framework of the described model of superconductivity, the vortex funnel formed by converging Cooper pairs is an unsteady electromagnetic system of macroscopic electron vortex of the tornado type. This is an axisymmetric vortex formation in which it is structurally possible to distinguish a plume or a tail, a train, some of the translations vary, a set of gradually narrowing spiral vortices funnel and a rotor. So basically, you've got something like that, and like a, that. A vortex of the smallest radius r at a given voltage at the contact. The mass is made up of Cooper pairs whose electrons have anti-parallel magnetic moments. In the orbit of the rotor monopole, the Cooper pairs reach the highest linear velocity and angular uh, momentum, or whatever it is, um, uh, velocities. Uh, as soon as the equality is fulfilled, the next pair of electrons is torn from the orbit by the Coulomb force and the electrons scatter in different directions in order to take a place in the tail of the monopole. T trail, <laughs> God, is translating it different each time, after some time. But first, uh, this pair of electrons emits a quantum of energy accumulated during the acceleration. As a result, during one rotor revolution cycle, the monopole emits quanta of energy which correspond to one period of alternating current through the Josephson contact. The electrons escaping from the orbit of the rotor are replaced by another batch from the monopole tail. The Cooper pairs that make up the monopole are Bose particles. And the monopole itself has a magnetic moment equal to this. That is, Dirac's monopole is a heavy fermion. In this one it says the distributions of electron density over the period of the spiral armature. Dirac's monopole is a self-organized system of electrons with a non-stationary electromagnetic structure of the force field. The emergence of Cooper pairs, their phase coherence in space-time, are all signs of the presence of an organized system, the unity of its elements and connections between them. The sudden appearance and destruction of superconductivity are also signs of the unity of the system's elements. Dependent characteristics such as mass, current, energy, power, rotor radius change with any external influence in order to maintain the integrity of the system. Thus, Dirac's monopole is a self-regulating system. Dirac's monopole is not one half of a magnet. Its magnetic lines of force are closed but there is a certain similarity with the true magnetic monopole, since the Dirac monopole has only one pole clearly expressed, the one where the rotor is located, and from where the continuous flow of electrons fly out. From this pole, a magnetic flux flows, the quanta of which are observed by researchers. Thus, the self-organized, non-stationary electromagnetic system of a macroscopic electron vortex of Cooper pairs is a Dirac magnetic monopole and manifests itself in the form of the non-stationary Josephson effect. Whole bunch of equations. Thus, the strength of the electric field of the monopole is tens of times greater than the strength of the Coulomb's repulsion. It is this force that causes the electrons to combine into Cooper pairs. And this was written in 2008. Okay, so now I will go back to the Bogdanovich paper that you have that, and you can see that essentially what he's saying is that you have this rotor on the top and this tail, and that's what he is referring to, and you saw in the diagrams that are uh, in this paper here where you've got the tail here. 
So I'll read that again. This version is confirmed by the analysis of traces representing in their curved part the cross-section of the conical surface identified with the electron trail. So essentially what they're saying is that this is only a cross-section. It's like 50% the way through the monopole or the strange radiation particle. It's basically a slice. So if you imagine this as a mushroom, you'll be slicing 50% through the mushroom and you'll be seeing the curved head and the stalk. That is an important concept. And of course, it's spinning. So it's not surprising that on one side you get a little bit more than the other as it's uh, kind of winding down or breaking up. Whereas the rectilinear trace can be a monopole track, this version requires clarification. The different orientation of the birds can be explained by the dynamics of the objects under consideration having both magnetic and electric charge. Now this is what was being said by Klimov. He was saying yes they have magnetic but they also have an electric charge to them. In non-homogeneous fields in space when both moving uh, both longitudinal and transverse components are affected on them so that the movement of the leading center monopole or quasi-monopole and it is a quasi-monopole it's not like actually a monopole but like the saying is it's effectively uh, a monopole because it's only expressing one of its poles can be overlapped by the rotation of the electronic tail trail plume <laughs> which in turn affects the movement of the monopole trail in general currently other versions are being considered and experiments are being planned to refine the nature of the properties of the physical objects the appearance of monopoles in the zone of PDFL localization can be explained by the non-zero probability of their location in the incoming water. When discharged along the surface of the jet, a part of the water evaporates, decomposes into components, hydrogen, oxygen, and ionizes, which presumably contributes to weakening of the monopole bonds if they are present there. Since the force lines of the magnetic field have the form of circles symmetrical with regard to the axis of the discharge, the trajectories of monopoles should look like unfolding flat spirals. At least at the beginning of an acceleration, if the monopoles are of the two types, northern and southern, the directions of motion are oncoming. As they accelerate, they build up electrons from the plasma surrounding the main body. And what does Ken Shoulders say? He says, EVOs, they feed on electrons of the discharge, which contributes to their radial acceleration. So the more electrons that they can gather, they get more radial acceleration. If not all, then at least some of these monopoles with a trail of electrons, presumably from Kuma pairs, penetrate through the envelope onto the surface of photographic paper where they stop leaving a trace in the form of birds. In case of the synchrotron experiment, it can be assumed that the monopoles were originally located on the magnet's surface facing the median plane where the electron beam moves. The halo of the electron beam and significant part of the Bremsstrahlung photons fall on these surfaces and can initiate the output of monopoles due to the photoelectric effect and secondary emission especially since the output is facilitated by the magnetic field of the magnet. So they're kind of saying that if you fire an ionizing beam at a strong magnet, you're going to get these monopoles flying off. Think about that. In the pole gap of the magnet, the air is strongly ionized, which facilitates the accumulation of monopoles with an electron trail. The dispersion of monopoles with a trail is likely to be in the direction of the motion of photons by virtue of the law of conservation of momentum. This is also facilitated by charging the envelope with the film up to a positive potential due to the emission of photoelectrons and the difference in the range of electrons and positrons when the substance passes after the formation of electron-positron pairs by the beam of Bronstrolling photons. The hypothesis for the presence of magnetic charges in the PDFL area is supported by the formation of pinch discharges, which in their structure are practically similar to the structure of a monopole, with a trail of rotating electrons. A distinctive feature can be the sizes, length up to several millimetres, which in this case can be provided by the presence of the base of each pinch 
of not one, but a significant number of monopoles. So essentially, they're saying these pinch discharges here, they've got a point and then it's spinning around. And actually, uh, one open researcher on Linear Forum has recently shown uh, this uh, kind of effect. To find them in quasi-stable state in a single cluster, it is sufficient to fulfill the conditions for charge uh, quasi-neutrality arising from the presence of not only electrons, but also positive ions in the zone of their localization, as well as certain ratio of parameters, density, cluster size, etc. These parameters are determined theoretically on the basis of gravitational model for estimating the parameters of pinch plasmoids. Conclusion the results obtained in the part related uh, to the detection of traces in the X-ray film in the form of their birds indicate that we are dealing with a fundamental property of matter, which is confirmed by their detection in the experiment of other authors. And then this work that was conducted at the Russian Science Foundation's National Research Nuclear University in Moscow was provided by this grant. So there we go. Now, this is many, many people that have observed these kind of things. And so what I want to do now is I want to just take you through uh, some slides that I have prepared that relate to this and some summaries of what has been discussed in this presentation so far and previous presentations. So magnetic monopoles. Aroitzker et al. believes strange radiation is due to a Loshak monopole. And this was published in 2002, and it was described by Loshak in 1995. Fredericks, that's Keith Fredericks, believes strange radiation is due to a tachyonic monopole. That is one that is traveling at faster than the speed of light. And this was published in 2013. Bogdanovich et al., the one we've just been going through, believes that strange radiation is due to a Dirac monopole. And this was published in May 2019, as described by Vizhnevsky in 2008. And the links were there in the presentation. So, this may help you to understand the cover slide for the Aroids Curve presentation that I ha uh, gave previously, Observation of Transformation of Chemical Elements During Electric Discharge. He was trying to establish whether or monopole, he was using the pure isotope nearly of iron-57 metal plates, and on them, he had, on maybe the back side, he had a north pole of a magnet on, on another piece at 90 degrees. Some distance away, he had a south pole of a magnet. And the idea was that uh, it would attract, th these things that were generated, both north and south monopoles, would be attracted to the iron. Respectively, the south direct monopoles would be attracted here. And although he calls them Loshak monopoles, uh, which are different, but anyway, the north one is attracted to the south. And then if you test these pieces of iron against a control plate, the Mossbauer resonance magnetic field will be different. And it was. And uh, uh, depending on the north and the south, it was the opposite sign of change by a, roughly the same amount for the duration of the experiment and the similar strength magnets. OK, so magnetic monopoles in Lena ball lightning. Shishkin et al have observed strange radiation in a wide range of experiments since 2009. He says they are magnetotoro electrical radiation and the neutral string vortex soliton form is likely a cluster of condensed cold neutrinos that can carry nuclei through materials such as metal and eject them later. He observed birdies on x-ray film. Aroitzkev et al. observed magnetic clusters, that's what he calls them, as ball-like plasma formations that had apparently carried nuclei of exploded foils through polyethylene. Also would seem capturing the carbon from the polyethylene. This is a similar observation to that observed by Shishkin and well characterized. He established that magnetonucleon ions, that is, a magnetic cluster that has captured some ions here or in the ring were acting as monopoles by use of 57 iron plates with magnets arranged with the north and south poles exposed to the radiation. Bogdanovich et al. observed plasmoids living four days in the same family of experimental work. He observed birdies exactly the same in form as Shishkin et al. 
These are concluded to be due to Dirac monopoles with a magnetic core. So, if you look at Loshak's paper from 1995, which I have a link to on uh, this page here, he concludes at the end that, therefore, this monopole may be considered as a magnetically excited neutrino. More exactly, we have a family of monopoles with different values of n and that the neutrino is in the ground state with n equals zero. It is thus natural to ask the question, is it possible that such monopoles have not only electromagnetic but weak interactions? And of course, we know that uh, Shishkin and, and many authors like Parkamov, they've observed weak interactions in their experiments. And this question leads to another one. Is it possible to produce monopoles in weak reactions instead of neutrinos? That is an interesting question. If it is so, there must be different families of monopoles associated with different leptons, electrons, muons, and tauons. Finally, this leads to the hypothesis that these monopoles could play a role in the magnetic activity of the sun, in particular, in the sunspots. Now, I read that a few hours ago, and I thought, nothing is new in heaven and earth. You know, the whole thing where I'm saying, oh, you, you've got these electromagnetic structures in, in Hutchison effect, and they cluster, and they form these uh, uh, magnetic flux line structures, which are identical to those I've seen on the Lion reactor, which are identical to things that are uh, eight times the diameter of the, the Earth on the sun, and they're sunspots. And he's saying, look, there we go. <laughs> Now, this was in 1995, so apart from the neutrinos produced by weak interactions responsible for the solar energy, massless monopoles could appear, and contrary to the ordinary neutrinos, they would undergo an important loss of energy in the condensed matter, and it could be possible explanation for the lack of registered solar neutrinos. Now, we know from Parkhamov's work that because cold neutrinos don't have the velocity to escape the sun's gravitational well, they get stuck there, and he says that they might be responsible for a lot of the transmutation that goes on that actually causes the uh, sun to work. And so we don't observe those, but if these were to cluster together into structures that then could get effectively magnetically excited, we then have the magnetic core for a magnetic monopole. So I just want to look at the, these various different theories and, and look at some of the data that we have produced over the years. So that's the Loshak monopole. I, I don't have a picture of particularly what that looks like. So I just put this quote here because it ties in with a lot of the observations by various authors. Uh, but there is this um, presentation here, which I watched in ICCF 18 in uh, University of Missouri. And it was by Keith Fredericks. And he calculated that if you were to take a, a monopole of this type, and it was just a sphere in the rest frame, and you did a superluminal transform, uh, i.e. making it into a tachyon, <laughs> uh, then you had this structure that came about. And that this could, by rotating it and, and moving it, produce a lot of the tracks. And I thought at the time that, yeah, this, this might explain the lion track. And so this was in the Lion Reactor. It was fortunately uh, just a curious identification by Alan Goldwater. He says, what's that? And it was very, very small, but he spotted it. And I went back to the, the thing three weeks later and managed to get possibly the most beautiful strange radiation track ever recorded, uh, the highest detail with the individual paw prints of something, which could be, I mean, it, it, these could be monopoles, and they could be arranged in, in a sort of bead cluster, like was observed uh, by, um, this is by Bostick, I think, in the 1950s, but it's in uh, Ken Shoulder's book, An Evia Tale of Discovery. So here's another cluster, and here is a, another sort of bead sort of ring. Now, if you can imagine this whole cluster came down and went blonk on the surface, uh, and it's created the spots, so you can imagine that sort of like... Uh, uh, rather than the cross section you're seeing, you're seeing the, the head hitting it. And so you, you get a different impression. But if it was coming on sideways and, and rotating and each of them were hitting in turn, you might get something like this. And, and, and as Bogdanovich said, the, the, the things in their clusters, they rotate themselves as well as the thing rotating or translating. 
Um, so anyway, that, that could explain the spatial arrangement, uh, potentially. But what I wasn't comfortable with, with the uh, superluminal transformed monopole of Keith Fredericks, ultimately, is that, and maybe he has it, and maybe it should be there, but I don't see this tail. So each of these has a tail. So you've got the, the two main arms and then a little bit that comes out here. Two main arms and a little bit that comes out here. Two main arms and a little bit that comes out here. And so, you know, depending on its orientation, if it's this way around, you've, you, you've got the two bits and you can see it's got some twist on it. And, and it's actually got a hole that goes either directly out or directly in. So this really wasn't doing it for me. Also, there seems to be sometimes... Firstly, there's the rotational aspect. So it's like broken out there and slapped in there. It's broken out there and slapped in there. This one, it's, broke, it's too clean on both sides. But you can kind of get its rotation because it's pushed up. It's pushed up from this side. Um, and you also have these spherical holes in the middle sometimes, depending on the orientation. And that, I think, is actually quite interesting as well. But it could be that this is split first. And then the, the structure, that kind of bead chain, was bouncing around on the surface. And individual ones are, are hitting the surface. And that might account for why on Bogdan Bogdanovich's work, this slightly kind of like an, looks a bit random. But anyway, so this really didn't do it for me. But if you look at Shishkin and Bogdanovich's, and, and I've just taken this Shishkin one, and it's one of the ones... From here, and I, I just colorized it to, to represent a, a, a north uh, um, monopole in this case and a south monopole in this case. If you take this one, uh, it actually does have the tail. Now, is it sucking in or pushing out? I, I, I kind of think it might be pushing out because you've kind of got this rotation function in here, but it's kind of pushed out to one side, it's pushed out to one side, it's pushed out to one side because it's actually traveling. It's, it's kind of spinning around here on its axis. And so the trail has a curvature to it, so there's a curvature to it, so it has a curvature to it. And so it's very, very fitting. And when it hits the surface, you're saying, why don't I see like the whole torah, the, the, the whole sort of mushroom head? Why don't, why don't I see that? Well, because it's kind of hitting a cross section and it kind of pulls something out of here and, and, and pushes in there. But it can only do so much before it's like kicked off again. Um, and so, you know, right at the core, in, in this case, it looks like it's eaten a whole sphere of material. When these things ultimately slow down, they actually uh, dump their ions that they have inside them. And this was very well characterized by Chishkin, as I've said a number of times, but also by Adam Inko, who didn't characterize it, but still observed the thing. So if you have plastics... And you have these things. When they hit them, they will create very large sort of impacts or, or damage to the plastics. And in the case of Bogdanovich, he's saying that there's thermal effects potentially. But it's very clear uh, from Shishkin's work, and it would seem from Adamenko's work, that the damage is actually something that is physical. Okay, so I then want to look at the work of Hutchison. And this is another slide from Ode. And these samples were received on the 4th of February 2018. And you can see this hexagon at the top of this. And this was apparently uh, formed inside the center of a large piece of aluminium. So it's been, the whole block has been cut and then it's been cut again. And you can see the hexagon there. But you can also see these sort of conical structures in here. Uh, very small, small conical one over here. And I've talked about these before. But... Um, what you have here is a sphere of material that's come out with this sort of bird wings either side. You have here a sphere of material and you have this curved section here with the tail. The curved section here with the tail here. And so I'm saying that what was caught in the magnetic core, the nucleons that were caught in the magnetic core, those that weren't ejected at the time of disruption, just go boom, and come back into our free space, the space as a sphere, as, as the compression, this small box is, the, the pressure is released, it goes boom and gives you a sphere of whatever material. And, you know, I'll come on to the, the ring and spot, but this is, in my view, uh, the spot um, that, that comes out. Uh, now, uh, so I have a comparison here. This is uh, a Bogdanovich uh, one. This may actually be a North Pole approaching a South Pole or vice versa. And they didn't quite meet before they 
lost all their energy. But again, it's a cross section. So here is a, a one from Shishkin. And what I've done is I've just upped the contrast. So you can see there's this section that comes in here from out here to in here to, to, to a point, the high density point, and then it comes out here. It's, it's basically like a mushroom. If you cut that mushroom in half, that's what you're seeing. And I will do an animation of these so you can get a better idea of what you are looking at. Um, but uh, so I say Shishkin here, Bogdanovich here, and nature. Oh. Don't tell nature what it is. Let nature show you, is what P. and Teddy told us in 2015. Magnetic monopoles. Loshak noted that his monopole may be considered a magnetically excited neutrino and could play an important role in sunspots. Aroitzker et al. thinks strange radiation is caused by right and left spinal Loshak monopoles and have a highly magnetic core that can capture ions. Shishkin et al. 2018 believe the core of his strange radiation birdies is a soliton of condensed cold neutrinos which can carry ions, partly because they can act in a neutral way that is passing through other materials just as uh, observed by Ken Shoulders and John Hutchison and partly because they can play a role in weak interactions. Uh, that is the basis of the Parkamov calculator that was developed by myself and Philip Power using Parkamov's data. And the technology was established by Alexander Parkamov and is in his book, Space Earth Human. Now, Bogdanovich et al. observed the exact same birdies as Shishkin et al. on both water flow plasma discharge and using synchrotron, using conversion material and a magnet, and considers them to be Dirac monopoles with a magnetic core. Now, there's a paper, Creation of Dirac Monopoles in Spina Bose-Einstein Condensates. So they have these uh, different things here with your, your pole and so forth, and this is your tail. Um, that's what they believe is the Dirac uh, structure. And they calculated this in a synthetic magnetic field. And uh, they have this tail here. So it's looking pretty similar. But I want you to look at this structure. And this is a four sequences through the formation, or one could imagine maybe the collapse of a Dirac monopole. And these are the particle densities. So you've actually got like a, a big uh, a sphere I guess, and then a sphere and a toroid, but it's a solid toroid, and then the toroid becomes a, a hole and so forth. Now, I want you to look at something from uh, the Amasa gas, which we know is a plasma. We know there's atomic hydrogen in there. We've seen that it might be producing some maser type effects, microwave laser type things. And there's this structure, and it does look remarkably like this Dirac monopole as um, calculated by Alto University. Creation of Dirac monopoles in Spina Bose Einstein Condensates. This is in physical review letters. There's a later one in Nature. There's a YouTube animation of this. This is the link to the video showing this and there's many other videos on the 10 yen coin on our site. But uh, the very interesting thing is it has these two structures. But on one side it's basically copper and the other side is zinc which is actually a small proportion of the overall metal. Uh, and so uh, it's kind of like one attached to one and one attached to the other. Uh, and then you kind of have this blob up here, this here, and then you have these, this curved bit here and these bits coming in here. Now, is it the same? I don't know. But what I can tell you, what I can tell you is we have already seen this structure a number of times on a variety of different technologies. And I shared one at ICCF 22 that was found in the core of the 225 day reactor from Alexander Parkamov. And I'll show you on the next slide that on this side, so if we're saying that the, the, the spin is going around this way, there's a spin going around that way. On this slide, we saw after we analyzed it, so the same structure is here, it's, it's turned around. So uh, this way, the tail is down here. And this way, the tail is, is going up here. So we're looking in this bowl, and it, it, I call them the cobblestones, it's like a pan. And what we found, and you can go and have a look at the video, it's called Snowballs on Cobblestones, something like that. 
Uh, maybe I'll put the link in before I share the presentation. What we found was that there was an oxide on the copper and that there were these little balls and they were kind of rolling around and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and running around in a trail and they were converting the oxygen, it would seem, to sulfur. This is a standard oxygen, 2 oxygen 16 to sulfur 32, George Oshawa transmutation. So, in this structure, that looks like a collapsed... So, if you, you imagine, why, why isn't it a half torus going all the way around here? Well, it's the same that this isn't a full mushroom. It's come in and it's, it's fallen apart. It's the same reason that you are seeing these structures here. They've come in, there's, they're, they're spinning... And they're able to lift something out of here and push something in there, but they, they kind of kicked off again. Uh, they can only go as far as their magnetic core will allow them to send to point, and, and then they bounce off again. And so they ride, a lot, ride along the surface, jumping along the surface. And so in this case, you know, it came in and, and, and it, it, it did what it did. It pulled a bit out of there and pushed a bit in there and uh, um, left its mark. Uh, but... Uh, it died, let's say, and and it left some substructures that were able to move around uh, and do their work on the cobblestones, uh, as I call them. And so it's, it's a very, very special thing to see the transmutation at that level. So that is Magnetic Signatures of Strange Radiation Part 3 and uh, bringing it all together. Thank you very much for your time, and I will see you in the next video. And it's going to be very special. I think if I can get it out this weekend, I, I want to. But it's about protecting people and uh, using all of this understanding. And it's also about knowing what you're doing. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you in the next video.